Hi, my name is Raquel, and I ordered bar sell. You have to have the money of the beast on your mind or in your hand. And they don't translate that word correctly in the New Testament. They don't translate a lot of these words correctly. And I thought, you know, I was going to become famous for my discovery. But it doesn't seem that anybody's interested. Uh-oh, what's going on here? There it is, the karagma. Uh, and it's not translated correctly. You can see the context, buying and selling. Well, it really means money. And here's the Liddell Scott Unabridged Greek English Dictionary that shows you the word karagma means the impress on the coin or number two, stamped money coin. And another word they don't really translate correctly is this logos. You know, in the beginning was the word in John 1.1, 1, 1, but it's rarely the word, you see, it's rarely the word. And this, this, these are from a dictionary of uh, etymologies. And uh, you can see logic. So whatever is, in the beginning was the logos, and it means logic. And <clears throat> whatever's logical is of God, and what's not logical is not of God. And like if you look up the etymology of the word devil, it shows you that it means to slander. And uh, so the devil is a slanderer and a uh, false accuser. And so like a lot of people that believe the truth, you know, the way to live life, such as eliminating money, which just seems very logical. In fact, I've written this gospel of eliminating money. I compiled a bunch of quotations from famous people who believed in eliminating money. And I put this all, all up on my website. In fact, you can make a PDF of this and print it out yourself. But a lot of famous people have believed in eliminating money. And I thought, you know, uh, you know Jesus told his disciples to go forth without money in, in their purses. And the problem is this guy, St. Paul, all these dumb Christians tell me that, oh, it's the love of money that's evil, you know, and that's what St. Paul says. But Jesus said you can't serve God or money. You'll either love the one or hate the other or hold to the one and despise the other. But the Pharisees who loved money heard all this and scoffed, and that's in Luke 16. And so, you know, Jesus was a radical, and this guy, St. Paul, is the one who ruined everything. You know, the Gospels, it's a very terse, book, you know, it's not like these Muslims who have to memorize this huge Koran, you know, it's like a blessing for them, you know, they would send these kids to these madrasas in, in these Middle Eastern countries to learn about the Koran, you know, but, you know, Jesus, you know, his logic and his, his philosophy and way of life is just wonderful, you know, he says to, um, give to the poor and love everybody, you know, it was like, they had this movie when I was growing up called, like, um, The Go Gospel, or Godspell, that's what it was, and it was a musical all about Jesus and his disciples, and they were all a bunch of hippies, you know, they, I don't think, they didn't take any drugs, of course, but, um, you know, LSD is kind of like a, a sacrament, you know, it's a very refined fungus, and it's like micrograms of this fungus are going to get you into another world. And uh, there's been some articles in the paper recently about it. You know, like a lot of cultures, you know, the Mexican culture, you know, the Aztecs and the Mayas, and, you know, they had psychedelic mushrooms down there, the psilocybin mushrooms. And uh, then they had this other things down there, too, that uh, the mezcal, the... Um, peyote buttons and mescaline and and um, so they had those kind of things and um, they even you know it's like um, whether you believe in God or not is more of an experience it's it's like to know God means to have sex with him you know to the, the, the word know in the Bible it has a double meaning like it can mean to have sex and it also means to know somebody and that's always been kind of one of my big questions. Like I remember one time when I was like homeless and traveling around hitchhiking with a backpack and stuff back like in the late 70s. And um, somebody taught me how to get food stamps, you know. And so 
you know, it was like you could get fifty dollars worth of food stamps, I think, or or was it more than that? I don't remember. It lasted me a long time though, so it was worth. It took me like sometimes three days to get them, you know. And one time, I was in Yuma, you know, camping out on the uh, Colorado River, and they were just harassing me, you know, and they insisted they wanted to see where I was camping at. So um, I invited them out there one time. I met them there. I don't know, like ten o'clock in the afternoon, and. Showed him, yeah, this is where I'm camping, and so they had to give me the food stamps. And after that, I left town. But um, why was I telling that story? I don't know. Um, so anyway, these uh, I'm, you know, I, this global warming thing has really gotten me scared. And this this is the book by Al Gore, The Inconvenient Truth, which was published in 2006. You know, and it's just you know looking back at this. And I have a thing on my website where I made copies of a lot of these pictures. And I'll just run through a few of them. This is a, a Mulan, um, a stream of meltwater up in the Arctic. And it's just uh, meltwater coming off. And, and so like Greenland, the ice up in Greenland is disappearing. Let me see if I can find the first one here. This is 1992. And these areas are, I guess they're melting. And you can see it's just getting worse worse and worse. So uh, this guy, Al Gore, you know, he put this all together with all these different charts. This one here shows the uh, 100 years of temperature. And, uh, you know, just if, if it's, you know, you have to have a baseline over here of zero. So you can see, we haven't had too many warming periods, but this is only goes to like the year 1000. And so they had this medieval warm period, but it's always been pretty cold. They've had, um, I guess none of these, of course, were the ice ages, but, so, but recently you can see how the, it's gotten much warmer just by a half a degree centigrade. And uh, so what the problem is, is this, all these carbon, mono carbon dioxides getting in the air. And it's just like shooting up here. And this is the, from, this, this chart goes all the way back to 600 BC, or 600, yeah, wait a minute, 600,000, uh, what is it? Years ago, yeah, <laughs> I'm thinking. So yeah, it's, that's how long ago it was, and it goes up here to uh, like 400 degrees, 400 parts per million. This is an old book, you see, it's up here now, and it's just going to keep going up, and the temperature's going to go up, and and it's going to melt the ice caps, and then, uh, but it's, uh, and then after that, it's the methane is going to start percolating up, and they talk about 400 parts per million, but it's really a lot higher if you figure in other greenhouse gases like uh, methane and nitric oxide and other things that get in the air to keep the like greenhouse effect. You know, if you go in a greenhouse and the sun is shining, it gets pretty hot in there. Oh boy, it's getting pretty hot here in Tucson too, and uh, they um, had a, a, a 90 degree day. Usually it's April 9th that we get our first 90 degree day, so we were only one day ahead. I, I heard one of my friends told me it was different than that, so, but I just found out that it really is a normal for us down here, but you know, it's been pretty hot these past few days, and and it's just kind of makes you feel like you're a frog in a pot of boiling water. And right now it's, you know, it's getting pretty close to boiling. And there's really nowhere to go, you know. It's like the Arctic area is actually where the climate is warming fastest. But, you know, of course it's colder up there. But, you know, I mean, there's so many people think they can, if, you know, it gets warmer, we can just start growing crops up in Canada and stuff like that. But... The soil up there is much different, so it just won't work. Plus, you have these huge temperature extremes, and uh, I just, uh, you know, it's. I've been wondering recently is when people first, how come we couldn't figure this out? You know, it's like how come people didn't know? 
I mean, we, we, I'm afraid we're going to become extinct, and I've been telling you this, like, you know, the, the, just a tiny fluctuation in the average temperature causes really serious, like, right, like they're saying in Syria, they, they're had, they had a drought there, a really bad drought that caused a million refugees to uh, leave a, a huge part of Syria, and uh, there's a new thing coming out on Showtime. If you go to my Facebook page, I, and Al Gore put a link to that too, this new, it's going to be a nine-hour series on Showtime about climate change. And I saw the first hour, and I put a link to it up on my Facebook page. And the first hour, it has um, some famous people, you know, instead of having newscasters, they put on, uh, well, they had that guy Tom Friedman from the New York Times, and he went to Syria, and he was showing maps of drought, and it was just like, you know, like huge drought in Syria. And they interviewed a few people from Syria, and some of them said, yes, we lived on farms there our whole lives, and we have never seen a drought this bad. So they had a, a million refugees from this drought, and then shortly after that, the, the riots started happening there, and this so-called revolution, you know, it's like, I don't know if any of these revolutions in the Middle East have done anything. It's like I've been telling you, the people in Libya, they had an article in the New York Times, they were interviewing some of the uh, uh, re rebels there, and they, they wanted McDonald's, that's what they wanted, and Kentucky Fried Chicken. It's like, you know, when I first, when I went to Thailand, you know, I was so surprised to see McDonald's there and Kentucky Fried Chicken and I think the, uh, what the heck, I don't know if it was the uh, uh, Pizza Hut they had there and I just kind of looked at the menu and they had like pineapple pizza and I don't know if they had a mango pizza or something, you know, they're trying to get these these uh, Thai, Thailand people to like pizzas and, you know, they don't have that there. and. Um, Anyway, these people in some of these countries, I'll just tell you we, the, the news here. We got this, uh, peop the birth rates, you know, I mean, it's gone down quite a lot in Mexico. You can see here the, uh, back in 1950, the average woman there had uh, almost seven children. And then it started to drop. And it's so the, down, uh, but still Mexico, you know, they went from like 30,000 or 30 million people to like 137 million people in not too many years. I think I got it. Here it is. Yeah, in 1940 they had 20 million people and then it uh, and then it went up to in the year 2000. There's uh, 100 million. That's just the year 2000. So I don't know where it is now. You know, I made this chart back in 2000. That's 14 years ago. <laughs> I made that with a Excel program. But I'm sure you can find it somewhere else. Here's the way the United States population looks. And I do have an article about immigration. This, this line here would be the United States population if we didn't allow any immigrants into this country. And... These, this was in today's New York Times, and, uh, and it let's see, I'll just show you one more thing here really quick. Uh, this, this world population, how it geometrically grows like this, and, and you know, it's like, I'm kind of really wondering, you know, like the, um, what is the history of this pollution and this global warming? It's like, when I was growing up, I was just asking my friend today, I guess she was born in England, though, and didn't come over here until, like, the early 70s. And she didn't remember this, but they used to have a commercial. Maybe I can find it and put it up on my Facebook page. This Native American, he's, like, you know, got the long hair and the feather coming out, and he's, I don't know what he's doing. He's canoeing, and he's paddling his canoe, and there's all kinds of garbage in the water, you know, and then he starts crying, and... And then maybe there's another one in the whole in, in, where he's looking at the sky and there's all these billows of smoke coming out of these chimneys or something, and you see a tear go down his eye. And I, I don't remember what it was an advertisement for or what, but you know, 
there was, I'm trying to figure out now what the history of this is. And I saw a video, and it's up on my Facebook page. It was like a half hour video about climate change. And they kind of go back into the history of who was the first person to realize that, you know, burning up all this um, coal and stuff, you know, during the industrial age, like 1850 onwards, I mean, like, most people, I mean, you know, they learn pretty quick that this smoke is toxic. You know, if you get up close to it and you breathe the fumes out of this chimney, it'll kill you, you know. They probably learn that pretty quick. So, you know, who was the first person to start thinking, the first scientist that saw all these smokestacks burning and thought to themselves that, you know, this this doesn't, this isn't a good idea, you know. It's like we... We have this huge, you know, it's like the ocean, you know, you throw something in the ocean and like this Fukushima thing and you think that it's all going to become diluted, you know, because it's going to become diluted because the ocean is so vast. But, you know, and we think that the sky is so vast and we can just dump tons, it's tons of these chemicals, you know, gigatons actually of carbon dioxide are being poured into the air from burning things. And so one of these people in this video, um, that guy, uh, Tom Friedman, went to Syria and they had a huge drought. And then, who the heck was it that went to Indonesia? It was another famous actor or a director or somebody. He goes to Indonesia and he's showing all these trees being burnt down. And they're, it's corrupt there, you know, so they can't stop it. You know, and trees, they uh, take out this carbon dioxide and you know they're good but they're actually not only destroying the trees but they're just they're burning them they're burning the trees that have stored up all this carbon dioxide and they're putting it up into the atmosphere and so this is contributing to global warming and then after they burn those trees down and clear the forest they start planting these palm trees cuz they were showing in this movie that's going to be showing on uh Showtime that the the palm oil they put like palm oil in Ben and Jerry's ice cream and they were going down the aisle at the food store looking at all the stuff that has palm oil in it and saying that palm oil is the leading agricultural commodity now. So um, you know there there it's a nine part series and I don't know you know I mean there's not that many people that that know about this methane thing and I didn't find out about it until just a, like a couple months ago. And this article was published in the Nation magazine, Coming Instant Planetary Emergency. And I put it up on my um, Facebook page. I seem to do everything on Facebook. It's like my um, website is really tanked. I think part of the reason is a lot of the links are broken and I haven't fixed them. And um, I don't know, it's just, it went from like, like 2 million views to like 15 million now, or rank, you know, Alexa rank. But, uh, so, like, who, how, I know they had a guy, I saw one of these movies, and I put it up on my Facebook page, where they, they show this, they inter, they tell you that this history of this climate change, somebody back, like, in 1870, that's how soon they realized that, but I don't know what, you know, exactly his, what he's discovered, I mean, or did he predict? I can't remember. But so that's what I'm more interested now in is, you know, like a history of the study of pollution, you know, and what were some of the early gloom and doomers, if there were any. I think there was an article in Popular Mechanics magazine, just a tiny little paragraph that somebody. This was also in that movie. So I'll I'll find out what that is and put some information about it up there on, on Facebook, but this was in the paper today, the front front page of the New York Times, they have the, in, the illegal people are starting to come across the border again, but the, most of these people that are coming here, they're trying to get asylum, and they're coming from these countries like um, <clears throat> from Central America, even with children, and they just come right across the border and turn themselves over in, in Texas. And then they go to court. And apparently the word has gotten out that they, uh, that they can get in here 
and 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 then the court, you know, instead of keeping him in jail, they they let him loose, you know. So the, these in, these people, the word gets back down there to them in their Central American country. So they, the, you can see here, this is the year two thousand over here, and back then we were, there were one hundred and twenty two thousand five hundred and one people apprehended and uh, and from Mexico and then down here from other countries it was only like 10,000 and it stayed that way and then there was a spike and they say that was because of a bunch of Brazilian people coming and it went back down and Mexico has come back down but they're starting to come up and so and they're starting to come up so if you add them two together here you know it, it's pretty high you know so uh, they're starting to come back around. But, uh, you know, I'm kind of the person that, you know, ideally, you know, there wouldn't be any boundaries, you know, international boundary lines. That, that's, you know, there would, it's, um, but there wouldn't be any money either. And so, um, you know, these boundary lines were created by man. But, you know, the only way we'd be able to eliminate these boundaries was if, if we eliminated money at the same time. But anyway, with this global warming coming along, it just doesn't look good. It's like if, you know, I was telling you about these refugees in Syria, and, and you know, they, we could have a, <clears throat> maybe a drought like this in California. They've had them before. They've done those tree ring studies, and, you know, they've had like 500-year droughts but this could be even another, it could be another drought combined with this global warming. And then this El Nino is going to come, but that might bring more rain. So, you know, we have these temperature fluctuations. They're saying this last March was like the third warmest March that we've had in the Northern Hemisphere. And it showed a map, an area where we live down here was warmer than usual. Like we didn't have any hard freezes. Or even any freezes that I can maybe maybe a couple, but not many. And so the other warming areas was like Alaska and Siberia. They showed like dark red areas in Siberia. They had a really hot winter this year. And I've seen, I think I saw, I don't know if it was a video on the national news or something, but they're saying that it was like the 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 temperatures up in some of these Siberian cities was like 20, 30 degrees above normal. And, the you know, they had to canoe to their fishing areas. They couldn't walk on the ice and get there or take their dog sleds. They had not canoe, but they had motorboats or something. But So, I mean, it's changing. And the worst part about it is if it's up in Siberia, is they have all this peat moss. And uh, peat moss is dead vegetation and, so, um, you know, decaying vegetation creates methane, and there's, like, huge amounts of methane up there. I don't quite understand how some of this methane got under the water. You know, like I said, I just found out about this about two months ago, but the, the methane got under the ocean up there, and, and it's been underneath the ice. And uh, if that ice up there melts, and they're predicting that the Arctic ice will totally disappear by like 2016. I've been saying 2015, but it's, I think there, uh, the, the Navy that came out with a study saying that by 2016 there might not be any ice. And if that happens, then instead of reflecting the heat from the sun, it's going to absorb into the ocean up there. And then the methane and will start evaporating, and the methane is like 20 times worse than CO2. And like a lot of these climate studies, like this, they just had that IPP, International Climate Change Report, come out, and they're saying that um, you know they're not they're they're not figuring in all the other greenhouse gases when they say 400 parts per million. Of carbon dioxide, they're not telling you about all the other things like, that are coming out of the, and like methane is produced by cows too, and so it creates cows create like 20% of the greenhouse gases, and those fires in Indonesia 
are creating quite a lot of the greenhouse gases. And so, like, the temperature lags 40 years behind the CO2. And I showed you that thing from Al Gore here, the, where it's just, well, they've been studying this for quite a while. This, they have a thing up in, uh, in Hawaii somewhere. Here it is. And it's just, you know, this CO2, it just keeps going up and up. Let's see if I can zoom out here a little bit. Now let's see how far it goes. Well, there you go. And it goes up and down because in the summer you have all the trees, you know, the trees have all the leaves on and they absorb the carbon dioxide. So, oh, actually, so it would be higher in the winter and then goes down in the summer. And here we are back in 1958 and it's about 310, 310 parts per million. And then, uh, so that would that be? Well, that would be about about 50 years, 50 years ago. And then now, well, I showed you before. This is an old book, but it's actually 400, and this this only goes to 390. So it's been slowly going up. This carbon carbon dioxide, you can see there, and, but like they don't figure in all these other greenhouse gases and they they've figured it out that like during these um great extinctions the temperatures have gone up and and um caused great extinctions and we're already having great extinctions there's like 200 animals dying every day i think it is or going extinct every day so you know it's like um they had an article, what was this here, a couple of days ago, this in the New York Times, you know, their global warming scare tactics. And this kind of shows you this, you know, I don't, this, they're saying that since 2006, American people believe that the media was exaggerating global warming. 42%. Today, today from about 34%. So more people think that the media is exaggerating global warming, but they're really not. Actually, these people... Uh, and then between Republicans and Democrats, there's a big difference about you know whether global warming is real or not. You know, In fact, they had that guy... Uh, what the heck was his name? They showed him in one of these videos I've seen recently, that, Al, that Perry guy in Texas whatever his first name is, Rick Perry. And uh, and he was given a, a town hall meeting when he was running for president, and he's telling everybody in the audience that global warming is the biggest hoax and a fraud. And, and some people even think Al Gore, you know, that he's, he's a big liar and a hypocrite. You know, that, that's what I was telling you about. These these devils slander these people. And, you know, these you see these commercials on TV and, um, you know, about fracking and stuff like that. I mean, they had an article on TV today, actually, on the news, where they were saying that fracking does cause earthquakes, you know, and uh, in diverse places. And so, like, um, and not only that, but this fracking releases a lot of methane. And um, so that's not good either. And when you see them, you know, like these oil wells and stuff, when you see those flares... That's all methane that they're burning off. You know, they're burning it off and turning it into carbon dioxide or something like that. You know, it's not. I don't know what the heck the benefit of doing that is. Maybe it makes it into a less toxic chemical or something. And then I got this today in the mail about the um, polar bears. You know, it's like I was trying to figure out. I mean, it's. It, I mean, I knew instinctively. I think a lot of people knew instinctively that you know things just can't go on like this you know with all this pollution and and all this you know they tore up the trolleys in Los Angeles and all the boulevards and put in these eight 16 lane highways through there you know it's like paved paradise and put up a parking lot you know it's like the world has changed so much you know it's like my dad 
you know, my, my mom, they've got pictures of them going camping and in like upper Michigan and, and even in Colorado. And um, when my grandparents, you know, we went to Boulder, Colorado. They, they, my grandpa taught at uh, the University of Colorado. He taught chemistry there. And we'd go visit them back in the 60s. And um, it's really changed a lot, you know, Boulder, Colorado. Even Steamboat Springs, I went to college there. Or not college, I went to high school there. And, um, you know, they only had one traffic light when I was there. And now they've got a whole bunch more. And it's, you know, all these expensive-looking cabins and everything. But, um, you know, I just... Uh, there's, this, they're starting to talk more about it. There, there's been articles about you know, how much they talk about global warming on the on the news. They had a special a few days ago on NBC with Ann Curry about uh, global warming. And it, it was pretty good. They had one guy on there, though, that he actually said at the very end, he was a scientist, he said that he's taking his daughter to Denmark because, you know, the northern, actually the southern latitudes are going to, last longer than the northern ones because um, it, it, all this methane is coming up from the north. That's where it's all located, so it'll take a longer time to reach down to the southern hemisphere. So, like, all these people like John Travolta with his 747, he can take all his Scientologist friends down to New Zealand and and live out the end of the world, you know. And um, so a lot of people... Um, are, well, and then the other guy on there, on that movie that's going to be on Showtime. No, oh, no, no, this was the one that was on NBC with Ann Curry. And they had another scientist on there, and he was saying, well, we left this for our children, you know, to figure out, you know, and they're all going to end up cursing him. You know, it's like, um, I don't know, my mom uh, kind of uh, turned all us off of, having children. None of my sisters had any children, and I never did. So, you know, it's like a question of, you know, I mean, I I would hate to have that kind of a burden to, it's, to have to deal with. You know, it's like, um, you know, the way this world is, and, you know, the, the unemployment, this funny money game we're playing, with this monopoly money, and they have a guy, uh, this Mr. Lewis, who uh, wrote this book about these high-speed traders on Wall Street. It's all a big game that these people manipulate the markets with. And it's like, you know, it's... I always resented these people making money off the sweat of my labor. When I worked on the railroad, I kept thinking, oh, these guys on Wall Street, they, they're making a big profit off of me. And, um, you know, I didn't like that. It's like, you know... This world could be such a a good place. When I when I was homeless, you know, I really was made you aware. You know, you'd see these um, garages with these people's car in them when it's raining out. You know, and you want to get out of the rain, but they they or you even want to find a place to sleep. But you know, their cars got a place, or or even their horses. You know, they build these these um, sheds for the horses. To sleep in, and um, they don't have sheds for people. You know, it's like they could do it so easily. But you know, the problem is we've got all these. Um, you know, just like the first problem, and even that guy that was discovered a long time ago. You know, the population problem. With the, I showed you earlier, they they realized that. But you know, and uh, you know, it's like when I grew up. My mom had that book, The Population Bomb, that was first came out in 1968. And I, you know, I was still maybe, I was pretty young then, but so I didn't read it. But I saw the picture, you know, the cover, and I asked my mom, what's this, you know? And she explained it to me. And, you know, I, I don't know, later, when I got to be in high school and co college, actually, I started reflecting on, you know, that this... Um, they had a Club of Rome come out, and I'm, I'm going to have to reread that book and see, you know, they had different parameters for extinction, and, you know, um, 
I can't remember if they figured in pollution and and if pol what 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 was the pollution that would cause extinction, and I don't remember, and and that's kind of what I want to find out more about, and that would be a really good subject for somebody to write about, it would be the history of pollution. You know, who was the first person to really discover this and realize it was a bad thing? You know, they had coal and soot back then, and I guess maybe they had a few bad days. And, but like, if you look at China today, or even like Los Angeles, I remember when I first went to Los Angeles in the late 60s or so, the pollution was really bad. You know, it was so bad it would hurt your eyes. And they did clear that up pretty good. But, you know, Bangkok, Thailand is polluted pretty bad, and China is too. And, you know, you wonder how much can this earth take? You know, I mean, it's like um, this guy, Dr. McPherson, who used to teach at the University of Arizona here, he's got a blog called Nature Bats Last. And he's, he's goes, he's, he believes that this methane can, is going to cause an extinction. It's going to raise the temperature up to like 130. And all it takes is just like one day of 130 to kill all the plants. And then, then, you know, it'll kill all the crops. And so obviously, you know, they'll probably be able to grow some crops up in Alaska, but not that much. So they're, we're looking at a mass extinction coming. And, um, you know, it's not, there's, I don't know, you know, it's basically, I think it's, you know, the whole oceans are going to die. This acid, acid, acidification of the oceans is going to, like, eventually kill all the fish because there's no plankton and and so that the all the, the, it's already like 40 percent less plankton in there but um you know it's like i always thought that this we were going to run out of oil you know i remember showing all the time i used to have these little charts i'd cut out showing the price of oil and drawing a line up to figure out but I think, you know, they're, they're manipulating this country and this world. And these, these plutocrats know, you know, I was saying, you know, that a lot of them have jets and yachts. And uh, one of my Facebook friends was saying, he lives in New York, he said he was talking to some of his uh, hedge fund friends, you know, with all the money. And they're, they're thinking of having a home up in Nova Scotia or something, you know, because they, you know, they a lot of people are starting to realize that, you know that it can't go on like this. It's unsustainable. You know, we're, we're, I thought, like I said, we were going to run out of oil, and then that would create chaos. But I actually think that we've burned so much of this oil that it, we've passed a tipping point, where it's like I was saying, it's 40 years a lag time, and there's so much of these chemicals already in the air that we could have a, a burn off. You know, even if, like, industrial civilization stopped immediately, like, all that pollution in China is keeping the planet a little bit cooler. But, like, if we stop polluting, I've heard that that would actually raise the global temperatures. So it's like, you know, you kind of wonder how we got this way. You know, we're, we're supposed to be so smart. And then, like, what the whole purpose is, I mean... You know, if there is a God, you know, and it's kind of like, it's like, man, you know, it's like, <clears throat> where, where, was it greed? I mean, or was it that nobody believed this person that came out with this? I mean, who came out with some of these studies? I know the Club of Rome did, and they had those commercials. I mean, a natural, normal person, you know, doesn't throw garbage in, in the ocean or doesn't throw tin cans and garbage into the lake or or you know it's just that's pollution and it's not good it's not good for the environment but on a, on a massive scale you know we're doing all these things you know especially burning all this stuff and uh so you know this fossil fuels and all you know all these cars we have it's like they want to make money off it they want to sell you a car and you know big money and Wall Street and all this stuff, and you know they they weren't designing these cities for people; they were designing them to make money. And so they tore out all the trolley lines, all the light rail lines, and 
put in freeways and they make you buy tires for your car and gasoline for your car. It's almost like another tax, you know, paying gasoline. It, it's just like a, a tax to live. And you have to pay insurance on your car. And, uh, you know, like we could have designed these cities so that every little block had their own weight room and 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 swimming pool and sauna and cafeteria, you know, and then <clears throat> everybody wouldn't have to have a refrigerator and and um, you know there'd be nice places to walk, you know, like we've got all this pavement out there, <clears throat> and the pavement is black and that absorbs heat. You know, I, somebody was saying, and I don't remember who this was, I think it was on Facebook, you know, they were saying that we could s s um, save a lot of energy by painting roofs white, you know, and uh, I, that's what they do a lot down here. Whoever said that didn't realize what goes on down here. They sell this white coating you can put on your roof down here in Tucson, and it really does work. It reflects the heat from the sun and keeps the roof of your house a little bit cooler but anyway it's like you know this money has this totally ruined this planet this greed for money and you know a lot of these famous people i've told you about you got to go to my website and look up this gospel of eliminating money it's it's like i said jesus christ told his disciples to go forth without any money in their purses in uh, saint thomas moore's utopia they didn't have any money St. Francis of Assisi told his disciples to go forth without money, and uh, um, the Eighth Party Program of the Soviet Union talked about eliminating money, and Karl Marx believed in eliminating money, and uh, Muammar Gaddafi, I was telling you how they slander people who believed in eliminating money, and Fidel Castro, and Pol Pot, the populist leader of Libya, and uh, Pol Pot actually eliminated money, and they started to get the economy going again. You know, the United States dropped so many bombs on Cambodia, and Bill Clinton back in 2000 just released more information about this. And I've been arguing on Wikipedia with people on there about, you know, exactly how many people were killed by the United States B-52 bombers over Cambodia in the 1970s, which led to Nixon's impeachment. And, like, these bombs created craters and and they destroyed dikes. You know, they were growing rice down there. And they also vaporized people, so you can't even count how many people are missing. So, like, they demonized Pol Pot. You know, how many of these... Um, killing fields were people that were actually killed during the U.S. bombing. It's like, to the victor goes the spoils, and Pol Pot was overthrown by Vietnam, and I, it's, um, I think partly because the Pol Pot expelled the Vietnamese. He didn't want them there. It was kind of a racist thing, I guess. But um, he started to get things back together again, and uh, and then they invaded, and so you know he would have been like the first like country to get rid of money, and uh, they had uh, like Castro, they didn't allow any Americans to go down there to see it <clears throat> because if they did, they would have realized, hey, you know this this country is much better than Mexico is, and it's much better off than Puerto Rico is. And so they didn't want people to go down to to see what it was like in Cuba. And plus a lot of the gangsters were mad because when Castro um, got overthrown, they kicked the mafia out of there. But um, oh, I got this book somebody recommended to me on, on Facebook. I'm, they have these groups on Facebook of like-minded people and... and um, I belong to a couple of groups about the Kennedy assassination. So uh, here they recommended this book by uh, David Talbot. And I, my question was, 
what did Bobby Kennedy think of his brother's death? And so this person recommended I read this book. And I haven't had time to read it yet, but I, I read the back, and I look at the index, and they mention E. Howard Hunt and Frank Sturgis in here. Well, at least E. Howard Hunt. I, I can't remember if they mentioned Sturgis. But, but um, so, I mean, this sounds like a, a really good book. I guess they do mention Sturgis. I can see it right there. And like I was telling you, that they arrested these guys in back of the grassy knoll. There's a picture of the people they arrested right there and there. And then uh, that's a picture of you, Howard Hunt, around the Watergate time when they got arrested. And uh, like, a, so, you know, Nixon was in Dallas the day uh, before Kennedy was assassinated and and Gerald Ford was on the Warren Commission. Ronald Reagan was on a commission uh, set up by the Rock, it was called the Rockefeller Commission and 1975, and they covered up this assassination. And uh, so, you know, I mean, the, like Al Gore, he lost that election down there in Florida. I think that was a big setup. And, uh, you know, it was in Jeb Bush's Texas or Florida there. And so, uh, you know, Al Gore lost. It would have, you know, if Al Gore would have won, we'd have had a better country too, because Gore was aware of this climate change, but I don't think his tax credits would have been enough to do anything, but this guy, George Bush, ended up, uh, you know, he realized that we have to get this oil any way we can, and then he allowed this 9-11 thing, and if you Google World Trade Center Building 7, that's what this is, WTC 7 collapse, you can see how it just came straight down this, and like zero seconds, then one, two seconds, and three seconds. They, for some reason or other, they blew up this World Trade Center Building Seven on 9/11 too. And there's there's other controversies like this Pentagon thing. They're, they had a hole that was blown out. Of, you know, they have like rings in the Pentagon, and like the third ring, it was like a perfect hole in there. And uh, and you know they're there's no evidence that they recovered any engines in there from this airplane. They were great big engines. Why didn't the why didn't the engines show you know damage anything? Because the building collapsed later. I mean, there's so much behind this. It's like fires have never destroyed a steel frame structured building before. And there was a petition recently to get on the ballot in New York to have a study, you know, a forensic study. I mean. Aren't people afraid to live in, in high-rise buildings? It's like, I mean, maybe you could come straight down like that. I never thought, you know, when I first heard about it, that a building could come straight down. I said, what do you mean? You know, like if an airplane came into it, you would think the top would fall over. It wouldn't just come straight down like that. But that's exactly what it did. And if you look at, like, pictures of Ground Zero, all you'll see is a bunch of girders. You know, there's no glass, there's no desks, everything was pulverized. You look at those clouds, it was a pyroclastic cloud of dust, and it covered lower Manhattan like several inches deep. Here's a picture of the pyroclastic explosion. There was some kind of a, a bomb inside this um, World Trade Center building, and I think it was a thermobaric bomb. Uh, and it wasn't a nuclear bomb because they could have detected the radiation. They had people on the ground checking the radiation. But there's like um, a really good book by David Griffin about Building 7, and I didn't bring it with me. But that, so, you know, that George Bush had to get that oil to keep the ball rolling here. You know, Saddam Hussein wanted to deal oil in uh, in his own currency, and Muammar Gaddafi wanted to start his own currency, and so I hear China and Russia might start doing that now too, start trading their oil in a different currency. So anyway, they've got um, this funny money and and all these other things. Here's a picture of uh, Miley Cyrus, and I just want to show you this really quick. She's got this outfit on, and there's like a big marijuana leaf there, and she's got like marijuana leaf um, glasses on, and it looks like this says something like 
advisory adult something. I can't read what this sign is. But anyway, I, I think that, um, you know, these people are just totally oblivious to what's going to happen in the future. And anyway, goodbye. God bless. Peace and love. <laughs>